Howard Doss. Sean Lockin. Man, we have got a, uh, a gentleman on here with us today that ki- came highly recommended. Actually, from someone else I reached out to to try to be here on the show. Uh, a good personal friend of mine named Corey Scott, a retired TPD officer who uh, worked with me in the gang unit for years, actually left the department to go into, uh, wanted to pursue getting a degree so he could counsel and help people. He was a former Marine um, police officer and you know, when I would do Corey's yearly evaluation every year, you know, kind of letting them know how they do the, one of the things that I year in and year out wrote in there was, man, you have a gift of talking to people. And he was so good at being able to talk to people from all walks of life that we dealt with. And I always wanted him to try to use that to his advantage to try to develop informants more. I thought he could, uh, you know, really, really get people to, to talk to him, to share, you know, information on criminals is what I was looking for. And he basically kind of took that and uh, went outside the law enforcement job so that he could help uh, military vets and police officers themselves who struggle with things in life. Anything from, you know, chemical dependency, PTSD, uh, you know, the stuff this just the job alone brings to you um, on your marriage and stuff like that. So I reached out to Corey. Uh, about being on here and he says man I've got a guy uh, that he has become friends with that he kind of uses as a mentor that he looks up to um, that's doing these same type of things just at another level and so he uh, got me in connection with uh, this guy Chad uh, Robicho and very very busy man very fortunate to have him here with us today so Chad brother appreciate your time no thank you guys for having me on and and you're absolutely right you know uh Man, it's been incredible to watch him come in our organization. He came through our program as a student, uh, like all of our leaders do, and went through our leadership program. And now, you know, I just think this month was his first time doing his own group, uh, mentoring his own group. And, uh, you know, he went because our leadership program is pretty thorough. So he, like, kind of right seat, left seat with, with some other team leaders. And he has his own group this time, and he just knocked out of the park. He's an incredible human being and great communicator and has a heart to really help. That he does, yeah. Leaders. Absolutely. And I, I was able to, you know, see that stuff firsthand and, and with Corey and not to make this episode about Corey, I just think the world of the guy is one of my closest friends. And, you know, I'll just give you an example real quick before we jump into getting into your, your story and all that. But I've seen him do things large scale, uh, everything from we have a yearly award banquet in our police department, the division that we worked at. Um, Corey sponsored uh, everybody there to attend, you know, the, the tickets to go to it one year. Um, another time we were in a car chase with some gangsters and they threw some, some, uh, stuff out the window of their car during the pursuit. And in this particular part of the town, it's not very favorable to call the police and cooperate and have them show with the house. So this lady had recovered something and she actually went down to a library down the street, called it in and said, Hey, I saw these guys throw this out the car. And, uh, she, you know, turned this stuff over to us. And the next day, Corey sent the lady flowers to her house. Oh. And I'm telling you just that's, that's who Corey is. Like literally he sent, he, he sent flowers to her house, just thanking her. Did he send us a drink to have on this podcast? Oh, well, cause it is called cocktails, it is and, called cocktails. cocktails and cocktails. So we're going to let Chad kind of get into the organization that he has founded and is the president of, and your story of getting into that. Uh, but the name of it is called the mighty Oaks program. So, we are drinking a little Woodford Reserve Double Oaked, kind of with the little oak name, giving, uh, giving some love back to you guys at Mighty Oak. So, Chad, huge thanks, brother. Appreciate you being on here with us today. And I know you're, you're not uh, drinking with us, so cheers to you, though. Woo! Mm. Cheers. That's good. <laughs> All right, Chad, I know you've had a kind of run through your story here, but uh, hopefully we've got listeners on here that are, uh, this is their first time hearing about you or even Mighty Oaks. Yeah. And- and, and listen, why it's important to me is we do have a lot of listeners that are affiliated, obviously, with law enforcement. There are a lot mm-hmm. of cops. There's a lot of cops families. Um, you and I both know the struggles that serving active duty law enforcement, the things we come across and the demons we uh, oftentimes end up with, which is kind of how you got to, uh, you know, where you did. So break yeah. it down for us. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I was I was United States Marine. Marine Corps is a big part of my family. Uh, my father was a Marine who served in Vietnam as an infantryman and, and dealt with a lot of the things that we help people at Mighty Oaks with. He came home and didn't get the help he needed. So, you know, alcohol abuse, uh, very violent man, a uh, lot of anxiety and depression in his life. And, you know, until the day he died, uh, I served as a Marine. 
uh, as a force reconnaissance Marine and special operations. I did eight deployments to Afghanistan. Both my sons are Marines. One of them went to Afghanistan as well. One of them speaking, not to keep going on Corey, one of them has become really close with Corey. Uh, and then, um, you know, not only was a force recon Marine and did a deployment to Afghanistan, but during that time, kind of intermittently during that time, I, I served as a police officer. I was a police officer in New Orleans uh, uh, for a few years, worked, uh, worked undercover narcotics, worked in the detective bureau, um, was on, in a, uh, a very high profile uh, on-duty shooting. Uh, so I you know, shot and killed a man in line of duty and then, uh, and then ended up going through the grand jury process that many officers go through and had to endure that. I served as the federal air marshal uh, and then back on active duty uh, it was in the middle of my active duty time to serve it, you know, go after 9 11 and go back to Afghanistan. So I had a little bit of both worlds. Uh, you, were busy. you were busy. Yeah, I, I, t- I tend to stay busy. That's kind of my personality. Uh, I always have to be engaged in something. Actually, the reason I went to law enforcement was never aspired to be in law enforcement. I did my four years of active duty, became a recon Marine, uh, wanted to deploy, but I wasn't there in peacetime. I went in 1993. So from 93 to 97 was my first four years. And I'm like, you know, we're not doing anything. I want so I switched to the reserves to third force recon company and uh wanted to go to college and go back in as an officer. And so I had a wife and kid at the time, and you know, Kathy and I got married and uh had Hunter was born and and uh had to have a job. So I one of the most things I qualified for was to be a police officer. So I became a police officer and had that Marine Corps special operations experience, but looked about 12 years old. So they threw me right in undercover right out of high school, uh, right back into high school. <laughs> so, 20, 21 jump street basically yeah, right yeah yeah right, right back into high school i'm like i was doing this all over but um but you know i really enjoy my time as a police officer but when 9 11 happened i was like man uh, i don't want not only do i want to go back in the marine corps active duty not just in the reserves uh i want to deploy but i didn't want to do it as an officer so i stayed enlisted and uh thought i was gonna deploy right away didn't get to deploy right away and so I went back from my unit to the Federal Air Marshal Service and then eventually back on active duty and, and to eight deployments to Afghanistan as part of a JSOC task force, a Joint Special Operations Command task force. Uh, for you listeners that don't know what it is, it's really the premier like tier one level of special operations. Uh, you're either going to go to, if, if you're in JSOC, you're going to be operating at more likely at Delta Force, CAG, or uh, Naval Special Warfare Development Group, which is uh, SEAL Team 6. So that's one of the few places you go to. And uh, so I, I did, uh, I was one of the few, like one of six force recon Marines that got to represent the Marine Corps there. Wow. That's and, uh, and did eight, eight deployments in that capacity. My job was AFO, advanced force operator. So essentially I was thrust back into doing undercover work because you typically work by yourself with local nationals and live with the local nationals, get to grow a big nasty beard and, and, uh, and essentially go out and build a clandestine infrastructure to put your uh, assaulters on target to capture or kill bad guys. So that's essentially what I did. Uh, in Afghanistan and, uh, you know, lived in remote parts of the, of the country across border to Pakistan. And, and during my time, I worked primarily with one interpreter who became my teammate and ultimately my, one of my greatest friends is Aziz. Uh, and uh, Aziz saved my life for multiple times and, uh, and was just, you know, ate dinner with his family, played soccer with his kids. And, and we just became very, very close and, uh, and did all eight of my deployments with him. Uh, during the end of my deployments, I started having started having these problems that I never thought I would deal with. But it really started with like just being pretty intense and angry, because uh, uh, you know being in that environment, being in Afghanistan, you kind of feel like you have to be a violent kind of intense person. This environment kind of feels it feels more natural to be that way. But unfortunately, I'd come home and, and be that way at home too. You know, I'd be in Afghanistan, I'd be back 24 hours later with my wife and kids, and I'm still like a this kind of violent person. I'm. I, you know, yell at my family and punch holes in the wall and slam doors and break things and, and just throw a temper tantrum like a 15 year old child and just was not a very kind person to be around. And uh, even one time and I talk about this a lot, my daughter was having a birthday party and I was so excited to make it home from Afghanistan for my daughter's birthday party. She was excited too. She's kind of like a self-proclaimed princess and even a girl that has like half birthdays. And, uh, and she was just like really happy dad was going to be home for a birthday. And I like, she said, she didn't like icing on her cake. She's pretty opinionated and just said that. And I remember like just flipping out and picking up my little girl's birthday cake and throwing it against the wall and destroying my little girl's birthday. Man. And I remember like in those moments like that, thinking like who behaves that way? Like what kind of, what kind of dad acts like that? But that was my behavior, pretty consistent basis. So that's about when I started like isolating myself from my family and just staying as busy as I could to not really deal with my behaviors around my family. And you know, my wife was just such an amazing like, mother and, 
father and husband and wife, she just took care of everything. So I was able to just focus on Afghanistan and my operations. And uh, over time, by not checking that anger and, and frustration, I started to manifest these physiological symptoms where my arms would go numb, my face would go numb, I feel like my throat was swelling shut, panic attacks. You know, I, I, I knew uh, this was anxiety, and anxiety, but I didn't want to talk to the guys I worked with because I knew you know, this little special operations group, if I voiced those concerns, they would, those guys would think I was weak because that's what I would have thought of them. And, uh, and if I went to mental health, I probably would have lost my top secret clearance at that time. So I didn't ask for the help that I needed. I just kept trying to deploy, push it down, drive forward. And uh, only the symptoms got worse. At some points I had this, what's called disassociation, where you feel like your mind kind of separates from your body. And uh, obviously that's happening in Afghanistan and combat environments, not a very healthy or safe place for that to happen. And then towards the end, we ended up having uh, 12 of our guys captured and killed. 10 of them were Afghans, which, you know, two Americans, but you may not, a lot of listeners may not think that was as big of a deal, but these 10 Afghans were my, they were my team. They were my, my brothers. Like I love these guys and they love me and I would have died for these guys. And, you know, they would have died for me. And in fact, I do believe they did die for me. And I was probably hanging on by a thread in that moment. And that's about when that thread price snapped and the wheels really become the fall off for me. And, uh, and I, I went on one more operation after that and, uh, some other bad things happened. But after that last operation, uh, I started having these moments to where, I felt like I was woke, waking up out of a fog and I, I couldn't really remember that last two week operation. I realized I wasn't only putting myself in danger, but I was putting other people in danger as well. And so I came home, I, I spoke up and I was brought home and, and I was diagnosed with PTSD and pulled from being able to deploy anymore. And uh, I was really dealing with two very different things at that time. I was dealing with one, uh, the level of a panic and anxiety was, it's really hard to describe unless anybody's having that level of panic attacks. Like, I was convinced that I was going to die, like in any moment. I could have been in the best hospital and a doctor had told me I was okay, but there was nothing that convinced me that I wasn't dying. Like imagine being in the bottom of a swimming pool, like chained to the floor, drowning, and you see air, like how desperate would you be for one breath of air? Like that, that level of panic, dying that way, but you never die, you never drown. It's 24 seven, that state of panic. And the medicine that gave me made me feel like I was going to die, like I was paranoid, it's poisoning me. And other medicine that gave me made me feel like a zombie. And so I couldn't, I wouldn't, wasn't content with the medicine. And then on top of that panic, I was dealing with just complete shame because I worked my whole life to make it in the Marine Corps to, I was started training for recon. When I was 13 years old, like running and swimming. And my brother and I were going to do it together. And my brother was killed when, we were, when he was 15 years old and I was 14. And so like now it's like a life promise for me and my brother to, to, to achieve this goal. And I made it in the Marine Corps, made it to recon, made it to force recon and made it to JSOC and got on this important mission. It was like, if I played football my whole life and made it to the NFL and made it to a Super Bowl, which would never happen. Cause I'm five foot three, but you get the parallel, right? I worked my whole life to make this goal and I get there and I failed and uh, I was just embarrassed. And uh, so my wife and my counselor were trying to find something to snap me out of it. And I got, uh, they taught me to getting the mats and doing jujitsu. And, and uh, you know, I think we have some mutual friends that do jujitsu. Uh, I say I did it since I was little, but I was still little. I did it. I did it since I was five years old. My whole life, I, uh, I've, I've been in martial arts. I was already a professional MMA fighter on the side, and I was pretty good at it. I was undefeated. And so when I got back on those mats and started grappling, it was like I found the cure. You can't think about Afghanistan and not and while you're training, your buddy's gonna beat you up. So you have to be mentally present. And I think when people are dealing with anxiety and stress, that physical uh, and mental, like pres being present in the moment, is really healthy. Uh, but you could have a medicine for something that, that helps you for being sick, but you could have used that medicine as well. And that's kind of what I did with jujitsu. I love jujitsu. Working with veterans is very stressful. When I get stressed out, I go to the gym and I find some 20 year old stud and I choke him out. Like I love doing jujitsu. <laughs> matter of fact, I just got my fourth degree black belt from Carlson Grace. Yeah. Dude, I was just going to say that, man. I actually made some notes here. And when I was writing this down, I said, man, I told Howard, I said, dude, that's, listen, just getting a black belt in jujitsu from a legit uh, you know, place as opposed to these places just want to take your money. I said, dude, that's right. a, that's a process. And the fact that he's fourth degree and, uh, you know, in that, in that Gracie, I said, that's fucking for real. And real quick, just a couple things I do want to bounce back to. Yeah, uh, you mentioned some other people in, in uh, that are <laughs> the MMA world. Do you know Pete Wilhelm by chance? You familiar with Pete? Oh yeah. I'm very good friends with Pete. And I yeah. usually go to school like once a year. Okay. Actually, so, well, not no lie, Chad, 30 minutes before you and I got on here, 
I literally just grabbed his number. I've known Pete for years also. I went over to his gym, Triton, a while back. I did not achieve fourth degree black belt, I will tell you that. Um, <laughs> I, 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 am a, I am a, yeah, I am a jiu-jitsu uh, practitioner's you know, wet dream because I'm six foot four and long and lean with a lot of limbs you can grab on. I mean, look at this neck, dude. It's like, like if I could put for – yeah, you get a it, it, the and the lower yeah, neck. It, like two people are practicing on me at a time. Like, so if I went in, if I was going in for like a neck tattoo, they're going to charge me a sleeve price. You know what I mean? That's how that's how long this neck is. But uh, Pete, I, my my son is nineteen, and he just recently has hit me up that he's wanted to start it and start kickboxing as well. He's built oh, like wow. tall and lean, and I, he says, "Man, I want." I said, "Do you want to do? Do you want to roll on the mat as well?" And he said, "Yeah." So. Uh, when I left the police department, I lost a lot of the contacts I had in that phone, my work phone and, I, and my personal phone. So I lost Pete's number. And I shit you not, 30 minutes before we got on here, I texted another buddy of mine from the department that's uh, that's been over there for a while at Pete's place at Triton. And I say, hey, man, can you shoot me Pete's number? So I just sent it to my son. So he's hopefully going to, you know, get get on the mat and, and, and get at it at some point himself. Pete's, but the place to, Pete's the place to go. And Reed Hasty, a friend of a uh, you know, mutual friend of uh Corey, Corey and I, is uh -huh. a, he's a black belt there too. And been, he's been at Mighty Oaks for a long time. And, and I mean, all those guys, even Pete's, Pete's been part of Mighty Oaks, Reed, yeah. Reed Tasty. They're, and, they're just good, good people there. And, and, and I may be wrong on this, but Pete was kind of one of the guys, if my understanding is correct, that kind of helped start some MMA or something like that for the Marine Corps. Um, I yeah, mean, he's a former, yeah. you know, he's a Marine himself and, and you know, he used to be married to a woman named Summer who was also Marine and, uh, she was into it and all that type of stuff. And I remember when they first came here to Tulsa years ago. Um, but one other thing I want to just kind of bounce back to, you're talking about your, your interpreter Aziz and, you know, the effect on these other Afghans that, you know, were your family essentially that were, uh, that were kidnapped and, and you hit right on there. You know, I don't know if the listeners quite understand or know what a big deal, uh, you know, when we were getting out of everybody out of Afghanistan or hope trying to get everybody out of Af Afghanistan here in this past year, um, a guy that I worked with on Live PD, uh, he's actually, he was the, our, our executive producer by the name of John Zito, and he was part of NBC World News, and he was embedded over there with the Marines before the invasion happened, before we went over there, you know, when all that started. And so he spent quite a bit of time and exact same thing they had this kid i think he was like 15 14 15 years old that was their interpreter and he started out as an interpreter for them on the news side then he started helping out with some of the military stuff and then was helping the special ops guys out and they were able you know through all this through his time he was able to get u.s citizenship but all of his family was still stuck over there and so when the Taliban was just now taking back over the country again as they did in this past year i mean i'm, I'm speaking to you and you know exactly what i'm what i'm referring to but they, John Zito, who's, you know, lifelong Manhattan guy living in New York, he got in touch with some of the former military guys, some of them that are even retired from when he was over there. And they orchestrated using special ops, using some private money, and were able to get all of this guy's family out of Asga Afghanistan. And, and I think they got him into South Carolina is where they got him. I'm talking like in-laws, everything, because Taliban people were going around hunting, trying to find him because he had been an interpreter for so long. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you know, but that might have been our group because uh, I, I, I decided, you know, when this started going down, when President Biden, I've been trying to get Aziz out for six years prior, him, him mm -hmm. his wife and six kids. And uh, the SIB, Special Immigrant Visa process, is very broken. And uh, it's supposed to be a nine-month process. That's our contractual obligation to them. And it's been six years for a guy like Aziz, who's you know, 20 years of special operations. And, uh, and uh, you know, I knew we were going get him, to get him out. And I knew Aziz and his wife and kids would be killed because of serving with me. And, uh, and I felt a obligation to go get my friend. And so I put together a group of about 12 former special operations guys. And we said, Hey, we're going to go get Aziz and his family. Uh, as we were making the plans to go get them, uh, one of my team members, uh, former, uh, Green Beret and, and CIA, CIA paramilitary officer, uh, identified about 3,500 orphan kids that were going to be left there as well. And said, Hey, if we're going to get Aziz and his family, let's get these kids too. And then we kind of paused for a minute and we were like, man, so many people are going to be left there. We have the means, we have the ability to do this. Let's make a bigger and broader plan. And so we did. And we took our plan to the, uh, to the UAE uh, government and the UAE supported us by giving us two C-17 planes, wow. pilots and air, an air strip, uh, a humanitarian center to bring people to. 
And so we made a, we made our plan was to get Americans that were left out behind uh, interpreters and their families, women that would be vulnerable Christians that would be persecuted and orphans. And uh, we went in the first day we got a, the first day we, we went outside the wire. Of course, we worked with the military, to get onto the airport. We sent our team outside the wire uh, in small three man teams and got uh, Aziz's family and 180 people the first day. We were like, wow, couldn't believe we pulled that off. Next day we got 800. And then after that became a blur because it was 24 seven. If you, you felt guilty for sleeping for five minutes, so it was like literally 24 seven because if you stopped to rest, somebody was going to be left behind or die. Yeah. So, I mean, one of our buddies, Sea Spray, he's like a super fit dude, kind of built like you, tall, lean. He lost 37 pounds in 10 days. And, and uh, just because we didn't stop. And, and, uh, and so at the end of that first 10 days, we didn't know how long we had before the military pulled out. But at the end of that first 10 days, we ended up, uh, ended up getting 12,000 people out. That's incredible. Yeah, that's amazing, yeah. dude. And then since then, we're still doing it. We got, in the last 45 days, we've got 80 Americans. We got uh, another 5,000. Uh, people out from remote airports we didn't stop because when the military left we're like there's still people here we have to keep going so we yeah and then, uh, and then we did a two-man uh myself and uh, active duty marine the staff sergeant dennis price who's being awarded the uh highest level of award for non-combat uh because of this he and i went into a neighboring country i won't say the name of a neighboring country and we uh we went into the border region and uh did 90 miles of border reconnaissance and built six routes out for those uh, afghans stuck in panjir valley and every night we there's like Chinese military everywhere and Russians and, uh, and, and the Taliban. And every night we swam across in the, the river into Afghanistan and built routes out. And, uh, and we, you know, are continuing to continuing to do this because, you know, our government kept, uh, should not have left in the first place, but that's a probably a whole nother uh, show, but we, we left our, these people behind, including Americans. And they're still there. Yeah. We, we're not going to stop. Nope, I agree 100%. As you said, this that could be a whole nother episode, but I uh, agree with you 100%. Um, man, another thing, just kind of go back to, you talked about uh, joining, joining the military, you know, went in, um, rose the ranks, got, as you said, to the NFL level that you were hoping to get to within the Marine Corps. But you kind of did the same thing with your education. Um, I mean, from, from my understanding, you know, you, you didn't finish high school, joined the Marines, got a GED, and didn't stop there either. Yeah, I, I got an MBA. Uh, I always joke when I speak. I'm like, I can't spell MBA, but I got one. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> get it in criminal justice because that's, that's that's how easy it is to get a criminal justice degree, man. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, master's in business administration and uh, international business. I used a lot for my job uh, in the military, doing you know doing the kind of uh, corporate cover stuff that I did in, in special operations. But uh, also, uh, I use it in nonprofit world now. I mean, I. Uh, it's, so it's, uh, I come from a family of people that, you know, don't graduate high school. So I was like first college graduate in my family to get an MBA was a you know, pretty big deal. And, and, uh, I'm not huge on secondary education unless you're going to use it. So I, I'm not the dad that pushed my kids to go to college just for the sake of doing it. If you could, you want to be a plumber, go get a plumber degree. I mean, we need lots of plumbers and electricians. And I, I'm not the person that believes that so much just go to college just because I think it's a terrible thing to make kids do it transitioning military veterans do. Uh, nope. but, uh, I agree. I I, <laughs> sorry, Chad, didn't mean to cut you off. Howard's got a couple girls who both have gone to college. I've got a, a son and a daughter. My daughter went, she's graduated. My son, the one, you know, talking about zero, zero desire to go to college. And he just said, he's like, dad, I hate school. I've always yeah. hated it. And I'm like, listen, I, that, that's fine. No problem. You just can't sit on your ass. Yeah. You know, as long as you're doing something, get at it. And, and he is, he's keeping himself busy and, and working. So, totally agree with that well this program that you have mighty oaks kind of for our listeners kind of explain what you guys do say that well, you bring somebody over i mean you've told a lot about your experience and how it works and some of the stuff you've done but where you the, the real nut cutting is what you, what you how you're helping people transition from a war zone back into the world right yeah well kind of i don't want to pick up too much where i left off but like i can't really explain it without saying that what happened with me. Like I had, I was, I was in that point of, you know, fighting and I got back after, you know, with my anxiety and dove into MMA and jujitsu and, and, uh, but it didn't help me. Right. I was, uh, I was looked successful professionally. I was, I won a world title. I was 18 and two as a pro fighting in all these big shows and successful as an athlete, but I was still, my life was spiraling down. My wife and I ended up, ended up in a fair, uh, fair. Uh, I, my wife and I filed for divorce, moved in two separate apartments and, 
And, uh, you know, that rock bottom for me ended up being, you know, sitting in a closet with a pistol in my hand, trying to decide whether I want to live or die. And, uh, you know, I had to conclude it that my family would be sad without me, but they would be better off. And, and, you know, the, uh, that same, uh, hopeless thought finds a home in the hearts of over 20 veterans every single day that made my family, you know, maybe the family loved ones would be sad without them, but they'd be better off. And you know, I decided I was to take my life and I sit in my closet with my pistol in my hand. I had a Glock 22, 40 caliber pistol. And I put that, I'd have my family pictures on the floor and try to build up the courage to put that, uh, that pistol to my head and pull that trigger. But every time I would, I would see this, uh, I, I would see this image of who was going to find me. My oldest son, Hunter had a key to my apartment at a time. And I knew he'd be the one to find me. So that was enough to pump the brakes. But the next day I'd be back at it again. And, you know, it was one morning and my wife came to my apartment and she knocked on the door. I wasn't going to answer her, but when I heard her voice, I kind of panicked. I hid that gun and I went to the door and started this big argument with her. And in this argument, uh, I was pretty much mad that she was there to stop me from killing myself, like offended she was there. And in this argument, she asked me a question that radically changed my life. And she asked me how I could do everything I did in the Marine Corps and become a recon Marine. She saw it all because we were together since 17 and 18 the fights and the discipline it took to train for these fights. She's like, how could you do all of that? But when it comes to your family, you'll quit. And, uh, you know, that, I don't know about you guys, but there's almost soul cutting words to be called the quitter. Mm -hmm. she's yeah. actually right. I, I quit on the most important things in my life, being a husband, being a father, including my own will to live. And so I made a pretty radical decision to get back in the fight. And I couldn't, I knew I couldn't do it by myself, but I knew I couldn't do it with the people I surrounded myself by. Cause I pretty much pushed accountability out of my life. And I asked my wife, was there some, body in her circle not my circle that could help hold me accountable to this because she was going to this really great church and i met a man named steve toth and when i met steve uh i had pretty much presented a plan to him how's it fix my life and uh it was on paper and he slid it back over to me i didn't even know the guy he told me i was going to fail i remember being pretty offended uh but what he told me was something that was life-changing he said this plan doesn't have anything to do with your relationship with god i'm not going to waste your time and i won't let you waste mine and and, it, and i tried everything i've been in the medication the counseling the VA programs, I had professional success and financial success, all those things, some things good, some things bad, but none of those things worked. And, uh, and so we have a saying at Mighty Oaks, if what you're doing is working, then why not try something different? And so I made a decision in that moment to surrender my life to, to God, to become a Christian. And Steve mentored me beyond that decision in biblical living. And what that really means, and that's where it ties to answering your question in the program, what that really means is for me was that all these bad things that happened to me in my life and childhood and Afghanistan, losing friends, as bad as those things were, those things didn't leave me being in a closet with a pistol in my hand. What led me there were the choices I made in response to those things. And as cliche as it sounds, I didn't have to let my past define my future. I could choose different things moving forward by intentionally calibrating my life to life as I believe it was created to live. And so I started doing that very intentionally, very deliberately. That's kind of my personality. And, and the result of that was restoration of my family. I've been married 26 years now. Uh, we just wrote a book, Fight for Us. It's coming out February 15th. Uh, nice. So uh, it's a marriage book. I, uh, I, I, also my book, uh, An Unfair Advantage, kind of about my life and that. So like I found restoration in those things and, and how I handled. Did I still get anxiety and depression? Of course I did. How do I, did I get angry? Of course, but how do I respond to it? And so biblical choices helped me to regain control of my life. Through that, I found hope and ultimately found purpose. And that purpose manifested for me in a deep desire to pay it forward to others. I realized other veterans were struggling first responders are struggling. People in general were struggling with the same things I was, but I felt like I had this solution. Like if I was dying of cancer, right? And that's my game to cure. I had to share it. And so that's how Mighty Oaks started. And the way we do Mighty Oaks is we do two different approaches. One is preventiveness and two is recovery. So the preventative side is our resiliency side. I go to bases around the world and I share my story and I speak on principles of the four pillars of resiliency, mind, body, spirit, social, and how the military talks about it, but I really helped them to find it and understand how to implement in their life. Uh, and I, I was just at Marine Corps boot camp a few days ago, spoke to 4,000 recruits. Uh, I've been doing that for seven years now and going to all that, speaking at Marine Corps boot camp. I've spoken to about 250,000 active duty troops and given away about 150,000 copies of my books in the last 10 years. And then our recovery program is our reg legacy program. That's what Corey and Reed Hasty uh, teach at. And we do 35 camps a year. And they're six days long, but followed on by a lifelong aftercare system. And, uh, and so we have active duty that go there on military orders, veterans, first responders, and spouses. And we pay for everything, including their travel to go. So if anybody listening is interested in going, there's no strings attached. We pay for everything. We do about 4 to $5 million a year in programming. 
And, uh, and so we've had 4,100 graduates from that program, but this year we're moving to about a thousand per year. And, uh, and you know, you guys are connected to Tulsa PD. I think they've had like 50, over 50 officers. Have yeah, come we, videos come yeah we've had, I mean, I'm not, you know, obviously not here to name anybody, but I know several, one of the, another guy that worked for me, uh, he attended it. Another guy out at, uh, out of our division or our narcotics unit. Uh, I know he is actually involved with your guys' program, both on the, he attended himself. He's in the, I guess, the mentoring side of stuff as yeah. well. Um, was just even locally here on the news talking about it, you know, about how important that program is. And uh, there's a, like I said, and you know, being on the job and that's, what's great about it is just like Howard and, you know, doing the, the ER nursing he's doing and doing all the COVID stuff. You just see shit, you deal with shit. And we've talked about it numerous times here on the podcast. We it's, you you hold you it get, in. I mean, people hold help. it in. You got to get help. You just do. And it, I think the, the, you know, guys like yourself and, and people like Corey and these other officers, when you said, you know, close to 50, maybe from just my department alone that are out there doing this thing, man, it's nothing, nothing but beneficial, you know, and that, that statistic, you talked about the number of active or the number of veterans, you know, 20, 22 a day or whatever that number is, uh, you know, taking their own lives, man, that's the whole goal is cutting that thing down for, for not just obviously anybody in our professions, but just people in general, man, to get yeah. that type of help that's out there. And, you know, and you kind of talked about it yourself about here you were, uh, not, you know, not to be cliche, not let your, your past define your future. And that's one of the things you talk about is, you know, basically getting off the X, not staying on the X. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the X is if you read my book, An Unfair Advantage, you talk about it. I speak about it a lot, but uh, it's kind of a fun story. Uh, it wasn't fun at the time, but. Uh, me, me and uh, myself and Aziz and, and uh, a Navy SEAL teammate of mine, we were three of us were in a vehicle and we were being chased by a truckload of Taliban guys and, uh, and ended up in this major intersection in uh, Masood Circle in, in the Kabul, Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, this, this truck, you know, probably about 15, 20, we, I was joking, I speak, I tell the joke, how many Taliban can you fit in a pickup truck? And the answer is <laughs> one, more, one more, right? It's, it's like piled in his truck and his, you know, you have AK-47s and RPG and, they cut us off and roadblocked us in at this intersection. And uh, that's the X, right? The X is the ambush site and the kill zone. And you know, a couple of things you learn in training about the X is, you know, kind of rules. Rule number one, you have to be able to identify your own X. And rule number two, you have to get off the X. You got to be able to move. Get off the damn X, yeah. You got to move. And, uh, and I had trained in kind of pursuit training uh, every year at Bill Scott Raceway in Virginia. And roadblock technique, you execute a ramming. Uh, a roadblock situation, you execute a ramming technique. And I hit my guys and aim my vehicle towards theirs. And. Probably one of my favorite memories of Afghanistan is when I smashed in that truck and the little Taliban guys went flying out the back and, <laughs> and we, got, we got we got off the X and uh and you know that that parallels to life so well like uh, there's gonna be times that you know you don't have to go to Afghanistan and, and be chased by the Taliban to find yourself in the X in life we all find ourselves in the X the question in life is like when we do what do we do right you have to be able to identify we're on the X you got to know you're in a bad situation you have to recognize your your, your the position you're in. And when you can recognize it, you can own responsibility for it, regardless of if you're victimized or not, you can own responsibility for it. And you can make the decision to get off the X to move uh, and to move forward. But, uh, you know, oftentimes we need to understand what moving forward looks like. How do we effectively move forward uh, as professional, like police officers and military per people? We know how to do that. But how do we do that in our personal lives? But right? how do we do that when we get in a financial crisis or depression or anxiety and a bad marriage? How do we identify we're on the X and how do we get off the X? Uh, you know, just like we learn those traits and, and, and skills in the military and law enforcement, just like I learned how to do that ramming technique by aligning my axles to their axles, my frame of my vehicle, their axles to knock that vehicle out of the way, right? There's methods and strategies in personal life too. We just have to learn them. And that's where I, I believe for me as a, as a Christian, like the Bible has incredible principles of how to overcome those obstacles in life. And, and that's what we teach it. Mighty Oaks Foundation. Uh, it's not an evangelical organization. I mean, I am an evangelical person because I'm a Christian and I want, you know, everyone's, uh, everyone to find the eternity in heaven, but the program isn't evangelical. We have lots of non-Christians come. We've had Satanists and atheists and agnostics come to the program, probably about 50, 50 of Christians and non-Christians that come, but we, where we're a faith-based program is regardless of where they stand, we teach what we believe to be biblical principles of the lives we were created to live. And say, okay, you're dealing with this. This is how you dealt with it. But here's a model of living that the Bible teaches. And if you would apply these principles to your life, you're going to land in a good spot. And uh, that's what we teach. And we teach on a peer-to-peer level, not a clinical level. I'm not against clinical care, by the way. 
I just don't believe it's a either or. One of the other things I get to do is, a, is in D.C., I'm, I'm an advocate for veterans policy. And I was uh, during the last administration, I was the chairman of the White House Coalition for Faith Based Programs and been able to put an executive order. I got an executive order signed by President Trump and some policies in place for faith based programs. So I believe veterans and, and all of us should, when we go for care, we should be able to choose from clinical or physical or faith based solutions. And it's not an either or. You can do a combination of. And so right. for Mighty Oaks, we don't do clinical, but uh, we provide peer-to-peer mentoring through faith-based solutions and had had extreme success with doing that. Man, you have done a lot and continue to do a lot. Uh, so just, uh, you know, for any of our listeners that are out there, any cops or, you know, spouses, families, things like that, that do have interest of, you know, listening to you talk about not only your story, but talking about uh, the professions and the people that struggle and deal with type of stuff, if they were to, you know, get into the program, um, and as you mentioned, you know, it's funded through you guys, through your foundation, what is a week of, uh, you know, the, the, the training, you know, kind of run us through roughly what a week is like for these guys, or men and women. I know there's women even from my own department that have gone as well. <coughs> yeah, so, you know, they'll show up. Uh, again, it's not clinical. So if you're worried about going there and, and having a clinical record kept of you, we this is why we have a lot of, pilots that would can't go get clinical care or, or, uh, or special operations like guys like my community that didn't want to get exposed. Like you don't have to worry about any clinicians keeping record of what you're going to do or say there. So that's very, that's a very important thing for people to understand. It's very uh, safe place to go get help uh, on a peer level. Uh, so when you get there, you're going to be broken up into teams and there'll be uh, maybe four brand new first time students on the team. There may be one or two guys that are there for the second or third time in that mentor process that you're talking about learning how to pay it forward. The Bible in Christian terms calls it discipleship. They're getting discipled how to pay it forward, taught how to lead in these principles, whether at Mighty Oaks in the future or even in your own communities. And then the, the, the main guy in that team will be a team leader, someone who's completed all of our leadership training and to take that team for that week uh, through that six days. And, uh, and then, they're going to sit through a series of classes, 14 classes. And those classes are, are subjects like character, discipline, how to manage your money, how to manage your time. And you might think like, what's managing your time? The class is called margin, have to do with PTSD. How about money? What's that have to do with PTSD? Well, it has everything to do with it. If you're living with anxiety and stress and in turmoil, and you're trying to fit 25 hours in a 24 hour day, it's not going to be good, right? There's a certain margin you have to have in your life. Uh, if you're, uh, living outside of your budget and your means, uh, that's going to add stress to your life. If your character is flawed, that's going to add, you know, problems and, and stress. So we, we look at basically everyday life issues and we help people make better decisions. And we do that by running them through exercises here in these classes, not just from instruction, but from a position of personal stories. So we, we have a curriculum, but our instructors are taught how to teach it through their personal story. So you're seeing it from a testimony, which is how people learn best. Uh, when they can relate one-on-one absolutely to peer, 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 other people's journeys and then they help them uh give application in their lives and have a plan out apply in their lives but ultimately at the end of the week where they leave with a support network to be able to apply that when they get home and uh so that's what they're gonna get when they when they're there there's a lot of fun recreation activities that we do not because they're therapeutic we you know we ride horses but it's not equine therapy it's just to break it up so we'll do things like ride horses zip line you know, we've done right water rafting, all kind of different fun things to do. Oil uh, wrestling? Any oil wrestling? wrestling? Yeah, yeah, we uh, did no, that no. after. <laughs> we used to do a one-legged pillow fight. But man, <laughs> the guys got carried away, and we have lots of guys with TBI brain injuries, and like we had to cut. <laughs> you know, you put you put something fun in, you got to you got to change it. You got to got to change it. Hey, speaking <laughs> of pillow fighting, have you seen there there are professional pillow fighting leagues I've now? Seen that. I've seen Dude, that. It's, it's like popping finished. up all over Instagram, man. And this is like in a ring, real pillow fighting. Have you seen that, Howard? Yeah, I'm a, uh, um, a fifth degree pillow fighter myself. <laughs> yes. I have. Uh, I've been interested in yeah. jumping in there. Yeah, I come, come get your tired MMA fighters do the bare knuckle fighting. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Oh, no, I don't no. want to do that, but I'll do the pillow fighting. Hey, listen, I, you would absolutely rip me in two, uh, obviously, in real life MMA. But if you're five three, I'm six four, and if it's strictly pillow fighting, I might be able to have an advantage here. Just use that distance Range, a little you know. bit, but I don't I'd know. Have to, I'd have to get on the inside like Mayweather. There you go, <laughs> absolutely. Hey Chad, we've got to tell you a little story before we go. We've got about three minutes left, but um, we always talk about Sean's always making this joke about if he's ever 
comes up to somebody and they've got cauliflower ears. I'm shooting him. He's going to shoot him. And he's going to, he said, I'm going to go to jail. Or he goes, I'm going to go to court. And the judge is going to go, why'd you shoot him? He had cauliflower ears. And he goes, well, what's that got to do with it? Let me show you. And he's going to present all the videos of guys like you whipping big six foot four guys' ass all day long. And he said, I would have got tore up. Yeah, that was kind of my, my joke at work. I said, man, if, and I was good, just like Corey, man, I think the, my my greatest uh, asset to my success in policing was his tongue. Well, I could talk, I could talk well to people, you know, and, and that's part of the game for that job. Uh, yeah. But I said, man, if there was some dude that wanted to bang it out and he had call flyers, he's like, I'm just shooting this dude, man. He's been in a hell of a lot more fights than I have. And he is going to fucking hurt me or take my gun. And I don't want that to happen. <laughs> so that was always my joke. Yeah, it's just been a standing joke with us, but yeah. I, I got him pretty I got him pretty bad. Yeah. yeah, they're 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 pretty sexy. You've been on the mat a little bit, that's for sure, huh? Do, do you still roll? Do you still I mean oh you I say you recently got your fourth degree yet, yeah. but I'm assuming competition days are behind you. No, I, well MMA. I, my last MMA fight was, you know, I did twenty pro MMA fights, I think six amateur before that. And and so that uh that ended in two thousand thirteen when Mighty Oaks got busy. Because you had to, you know, if you're going to fight MMA at the level I was fighting, oh yeah, you have to full be time, top ten level, you have to be focused and and full time. And it would have been a, it would have been a distraction for Mighty Oaks. However, I do still compete jiu jitsu, and I uh, because I don't train for the match. I just train like I do every day. People run, lift. I, I don't prepare for the match. I just train. So uh, I've competed in international Brazilian jiu jitsu uh, federation quite a bit as a black belt. I've won, I've won international opens, won gold there, won American nationals two years ago. No big, uh, and, no big. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was some goals I had because I didn't get to do those things while I was in MMA. And then last year I won a, uh, uh, they had these pro jiu-jitsu matches. Uh, so I did Seb Hunter Pro, won their, won their belt, their no-gi belt. And, uh, and then next weekend I'm defending it. Uh, so for you. So Where's I, that I just, at? In Houston. And so it might be on UFC Fight Pass. I don't know where it's going to be at, but Sub Hunter Pro is the organization. But I, I like a lot of people are like, man, we know what you have going in your life right now. Why do you still compete? You don't have to. Like, I don't have anything to prove. Uh, and uh, it's probably I don't have the time to do it. But uh, the answer to that question is why is because it's just healthy for me, uh, like mentally and physically. Like, when I put, I try to compete three or four times a year. And what happens with me is no matter how busy my life is, what kind of big stuff I have going on, when I put that date on the calendar and say I'm competing this date, the regimen of my life, the discipline of my life changes. Everything changes. Like, I'm a, I'm a, I manage my time better. I'm a better at my performance in my work. I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. My prayer life is better. Like my life just becomes super regimented because I have this date to compete on my calendar. And so it's super healthy for me physically and mentally to compete like that. It's always good to have goals like that, man. I I have one question before we leave. How many hours a a night do you sleep? You sleep. As much shit as you're doing, I'm I'm gonna guess like what do you say, three and a half? Yeah, well you're yeah, you're the perfect example of trying to cram twenty five hours into twenty four, man. I am. But I I will tell you you guys are wrong. I actually sleep eight to nine hours a night. Damn, oh, good nice. for you. You doing gummies yeah. or something, man? How's that happening? <laughs> I, I actually I don't I don't, do, I don't do gummies. I do uh I, I actually have a uh, there's a place in te- in Florida called Regenesis and they have me in a really good because I used to sleep three to four. Yeah. And, uh, and then I, I got on this regiment, uh, vitamin regimen. So I yep, do like a, yep. a amino acid at night. I do, uh, GABA cortisol cone, which is something that brings my cortisol level down. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and man, I sleep so good, but I feel like I'm just more efficient. I get less hours in the day to work, but I'm more efficient. You're, you're more productive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and Chad, before we do get off of here, um, man, real quick, plug your books, plug your website, your Instagram, everything. Cause this is one definitely a, a lot of our listeners are going to want to, you know, look you back up. Besides watch some of your MMA fights that are on YouTube, which I've done, but, uh, you know, for, for the Mighty Oaks program. Yeah. So one of my older books uh, I'm going to plug because I think it's be good for a lot of the uh, military and first responders listening. It's called An Unfair Advantage. Uh, you can get it anywhere, anywhere. You can find books, uh, even on our website, on our own website. But An Unfair Advantage, uh, it's really just stories of my life and then biblical principles that helped me calibrate my life moving forward. Uh, February 15th, it's on pre-sale now, uh, fight for us. It's a, uh, it's our marriage book. My wife and I wrote, uh, I had a, a guy help me write it. Adam Davis, who's a police officer as well. Uh, does a lot of law enforcement stuff. Really great guy. Uh, you should have him on the show sometime. In fact, uh, Adam Davis, uh, uh, has written a bunch of other, other stuff. Anyways, uh, fight for us is our marriage book it comes out February 15th and you can pre-order it now. Thomas uh, Thomas Nelson is my publisher, and then I have another book 
coming out. I'll just mention it because we talked about it. Uh, I'm going to tell the stories about of Afghanistan withdrawal. It's called oh, Saving wow. Aziz. And uh, Saving Aziz, uh, how the mission to save one turned into calling to rescue thousands. And, uh, and Thomas Nelson is putting a lot behind this. It. It's going to be a really big book coming out October 14th. Uh, That's so, uh, so chadrobishow.com is my website, uh, mightyoaksprograms.org. And you could donate there uh, to help us do our programs. Or if you're a first responder, veteran, active duty service member, spouse, you can sign up there and get free programming and we'll uh, promise you won't regret ever coming if you're, in, if you're struggling or just need help or just want to get back, kind of fine tune your life. Uh, Chad, brother, you are, uh, you're doing amazing things out there, not only obviously in your past with what you've done, you know, with the Marines for this country and for the people in Afghanistan, but continue to do so here today. So brother, cheers to you and thanks cheers for being to on you, here. Cheers sir. We appreciate it. <laughs>